And we're live, and you're here, and I'm glad. Welcome to ParagglidingTalk.com. I'm your host, Robert Michaels. So excited that you're here. And uh, we have a special guest tonight. Nick Hawks is with us. We are going to have a great time. We also are joined by Pair Perspective. And uh, Pair Perspective is going to help us with moderation. He is a paramotor pilot. Somebody's calling me and it's ringing in my ears. That was really loud. So glad that you're here tonight. Uh, if you are new to the show, if you haven't seen it and you just were stumbling upon live broadcast, you're in the right place if you're interested in flying. We're going to talk about paragliding. We're going to talk about free flight motoring. We're going to talk about uh, thermals, all kinds of good stuff, how you can fly safer. And uh, I want to encourage you to support the show financially. If you find anything in this show that uh, you think that you would add to your tool belt of flying, uh, consider investing through Patreon. And there's links in the description how you can do that. We have quite a few people that are supporting the show, keeping it going. It's a great day to fly today. and um, But we're going to do the show. So I want to encourage you to support the show financially because otherwise I'm going to go flying. All right, everybody relax. Okay, sorry about that. It's going to be okay. What's up, Max? If you don't know about the show, it is the uh, – if you don't know about what's happening in the future shows and the past shows, you can go and check out paraglidingtalk.com. You can find out all the details of the uh, good stuff. We Last week we had uh, Paul Gushbauer. Is that right? Yeah, Paul. He, he came on. on huh? Cool. Yeah, he was he was great, great fun. And um, – and uh, some of the other shows, we were trying to get Gavin to come back on. I think we're gonna we're gonna beg Gavin to come back again. Gavin McClurg, he was such a great show. And um, but anyways, without further ado, Nick Hawks is a great friend of mine. Uh, he's he and I have been flying together for about a year now, and uh, he started just a few months before I did. And we met each other at one of the local flying spots. He's got a major Stoke factor. When it comes to paragliding and it's super uh, uh i want to say it's a attractive attribute that he has it just makes you want to go and fly he'll call you and he'll tell you hey what's up let's go let's go fly and i'm like oh, well i don't feel like it's good let's go let's go fly and uh he's got a great background with uh adventure if you you can find him on facebook you can find some of his stories and we're gonna dig his dig into his brain tonight find out what makes him tick he owns a company called uh, paleotreats.com. Go check out paleotreats.com. He's got some great snacks on there. If you're into the dieting thing, if you're into living clean and eating clean, which is uh, a big part of his life, and and I'm st slowly but surely starting to adapt to that lifestyle, and uh, we might talk a little bit about that tonight on tonight's show. And uh, also, uh, he uh, we're going shirts off for this one, right? Do it. It is pretty hot. <laughs> Shirts versus skins. Speaking yeah. of shirts, check this bad boy out. Blossom, soon to be available. And I'm thinking about making some t-shirts too. And uh, maybe we'll slang them on the on the website or give them away as gifts for people. Maybe look, at the, look, people yeah. look who's in the chat. Did you see that? Carl Which Colorado. Is, Carl, Max yeah. Martini. Oh. Mr. Max, we got a good crowd. Put your Mr. C. Get your microphone out and come on with us, Max, if you if you can. Yeah, so, I, could, I could use some some tips and pointers. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no he, doubt. He was the first person that we had on the show. He was he was the nicest guy to to actually come when when we didn't. He was the very first one, man. Huh. We got a special special place in my heart, Max. So tonight, uh, also what I wanted to mention was that, uh, and Nick will probably be mad for me sharing this, but uh, Nick was also a part of the SEAL team. So he is one of our warriors and one of uh, the baddest people on the planet, toughest oh, well. people on the planet. Long time ago. Yeah. You yeah. say whatever you I want. Be but... 200 pounds, but <laughs> <laughs> shrunk down to 150. Well, welcome 152. Home, brother. <laughs> yeah. No, I got out a long time ago. So yeah, no, it's still rad. Long ago. Once a SEAL, always welcome a SEAL home. in my my opinion uh now neil you're also part of the military and he's at work serving military guys and yeah, uh i was uh i was an army tanker tank gunner and uh 
Ray, I work part time at a homeless veterans house, so that's where I am tonight. Right on, dude. Yeah, I really appreciate that, man. Super cool. Yeah, regular go check out Neil's. What's that, Nick? It's a regular old veteran show here. That's right. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So uh, go yeah, check out uh, Neil's Pair Perspective. Go check out his channel. And uh, he was telling me that he's getting ready to fly. They finally just just got through their last storm, I hope, with snow. I hope so, man. Gosh. I got to put in a plug for uh, something I started doing. Um I've been I've been going downtown Buffalo and feeding homeless people for about almost two years now, and I'm starting to film it. So oh, nice. I'm gonna be making videos of that stuff. I posted one up last week, so getting that started. Put put on up about every other week or so. Oh, cool. nice. So get a little interesting video into the lives of homeless people. Right on, man. Yep. Okay, yeah, man. so. I want to dive right in. We're going to talk about some some paragliding things. First, I want to just get your uh, – how did you end up in this sport? And, and I mean, you're, you're flying around. How, how did you come from not, you know – From nobody to somebody. Yeah, to being the <laughs> coolest guy here tonight. Oh, that's funny. So I was uh, – let's see. I was running a bunch, um, running – the last thing I did was uh, Leadville 100. So it's an ultra marathon. It's 100 miles up in Colorado. Most of it's above 9,000 feet. And I got tired of, of running. It took me three years to finish that. The first two years, I didn't finish. The third year, I finally knocked it out. But I love the outdoors, so I wanted to, to stick it out in the outdoors. And I was kind of casting about looking for what the next thing was. I, I was pretty sure it wasn't going to be uh, long distance running. And I saw this movie, Rocky Mountains Traverse, that had, of course, gavin and and uh will gadden it and i thought that was the raddest thing i could i could do and what a cool way to see the uh the back country so i got super psyched on it started telling everybody i knew that i was going to go figure out paragliding and then ran into the the fairly harsh reality that it was a five to ten thousand dollar sport to get into if i went through the normal channels and i got lucky enough to meet up with the lady who is super psyched to teach people and i um wendy I bought, uh, Wendy, yeah, Wendy Pepper Shus. Yep. Yeah, is she watching tonight? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, if she's on, say hi. But you're cold-hearted. You didn't send her the invite. <laughs> Good old Wendy Pep. Yeah, <laughs> she, that, she was awesome. She made it super cool to learn, um, super easy. She's got a ton of instructing experience with teaching in general. But I was one of her first paraglider students, um, and she let me buy a wing from her with the Ethereum, which is a type of cryptocurrency that I'd bought when it was super low and i happened to have a little bit as it as it went up and had just enough to buy the first wing and then from there it just kind of caught and i got super psyched on it um, did a couple podcasts with gavin started talking to him a bunch and figuring out what i could do and got really excited about the the state of the sport where it is and where it could go and how much is still undone um you know one of the big projects that i'm stoked on is this spine of baja idea i don't think anyone's flown the spine of baja from north to south or south to north but it looks like there's a convergence that sets up right over that spine um, that should be should be flyable once once you get good enough. So that's kind of one of the super cool things to do. That That is what I wanted to talk about tonight. When we get into the meat of the show, we're going to talk about preparation and, and uh, some of the things that uh, you're planning on doing. That's one of the big things. So, I mean, <clears throat> did you see somebody flying and you were like, I want to do that? No. No, I mean, How aside from that Rocky Mountains Traverse, which I thought was rad, you know, they that was kind of the, the intro to the fact that paragliding could be uh, a means of travel, of getting from one place to another. How did you find Wendy? Wendy was a friend of a friend. Okay. And so you're like, I want to fly paraglider. And you started just telling people, I'm going to fly paraglider. And yeah, then all of a sudden they're like, this is my next sport. This is going to be so cool. And I was talking about this sport I had no idea about. And then I, I ran into Wendy and luckily she's pretty down to earth. And she's like, okay. Calm Stop down. with the silly talking and let's kind of figure out how you're going to get there. And then she came over and brought over this wing and she made me or the way it worked out because she was living up in Oregon. Most of the time, she's kind of cruised through San Diego where I live every so often. Um, she had me kiting for, I don't know, four months. And I was kiting pretty much every day going down to the park and just trying to get that thing up and over my head and stable um, and, and failing for most the most part. And you know, working it and working it, working it, and finally getting to the point where it's like, okay, I can get this thing up and get it stable, and then seeing how do I get it to go from side to side and down and halfway down, and how I hover it, and can I spin this thing? And it was a pretty old wing and pretty beat up, so 
and my skill levels was pretty low. So I couldn't, couldn't get the spin, but started to make it to dance a little bit. And then eventually she said, Hey, let's have you come up to Oregon where I am. We'll uh, drive up and down the coast and just find as many flying spots as we can and zing you off a bunch of launches. And that's what we did. We started off at the, uh, at the dunes I forget the name of it, but, um, yeah, going like real, real small flights, you know, 10 second flights, 15 second flights, hitting, hitting little landing targets and then progress to a, you know, cliff flight and right off there onto the beach. And the whole thing was like, ah, it was still, it was scary. I mean, it wasn't boring, but it wasn't super cool yet. It was just like, okay, I got to go through these motions to get where I want to go. Um, and eventually it started to to hook in like, okay, this is, this is pretty rad, but that, that took a long time. The, The funny thing was for the first eight months of my paragliding career, um, you know, it was just a, a fairly unpleasant sport for me to do because it was so, so scary. So th- one of the things that um, really stood out when I first met Nick was that um, he <clears throat> was so passionate about uh, kiting. And also, if you guys don't know, Nick was on Gavin McClurg's or vice versa. Gavin McClurg was on um, Nick's podcast and Nick was actually going to help Gavin. Um, he was he offered to help him with the uh, X Alps. And so they were kind of moving things around to make that happen. And and um, that was very interesting to me because when I first started flying, I was just searching any information from anyone and everywhere. And I remember when I first heard Nick, he was like, hey, have you heard of uh, Gavin McClurg? And I'm like, nah, I don't know what that is. And uh, he goes, go watch this video when you get home. And I had no idea. He, he didn't fluff it up or nothing. And I went home and I watched that. And I don't think I was ever the same since I watched that video. It was a Rocky and, Mountains Traverse video. Yeah, Rocky that's Mountains on Traverse. Red TV that's free. Totally yeah. Google that. That's the raddest thing you can watch as a paraglider pilot, as a starting one, anyway. Yep. I posted that. His video is on the um, on his advertisement in our website, paraglidingtalk.com. If you click on the pictures of the videos, and it, it'll, it'll play that video for you. Incredible. Incredible. You'll be on the edge of your seat, especially if you're a pilot, even if you're not a pilot. It, you'll be sucked in, and if you like adventure, anything adventurous, uh, you'll you'll be into it. So, um, you mo- you progressed pretty quickly in in the um, in the comparison to most people because you've aggressively pursued the sport. Maybe talk about that a little bit and uh, tell us what the benefits are of doing it often and accelerating and and learning on the fast curve. Yeah, man. I don't know if I progressed that fast. I'm still still figuring it out. But um, yeah, it was one of those things. Just listening to the pro pilots talk, as they said over and over, that uh, frequency and currency are the things that'll that'll keep you the safest and get you where, of course, get you where you want to go the fastest. And that was something where I didn't know it at the time, but I realized that I got really lucky living in San Diego. We can fly year round here, and we can kite year round here. We can ground handle. So. Is one of those things where almost every day there was an opportunity for me to get under that wing, whether it was on the ground or in the sky. And that was just a really exciting thing because it was such a skill heavy sport. It is such a skill heavy sport. And that's just a, a cool thing to have a skill that you can't do, but know that if you throw enough time at it and enough effort that, uh, that you can get better at it. And it's, it's cool to see, you know, as, as we both of us have progressed, it's fun to see, you know, we're not kicking our legs off launch anymore and not kind of wriggling around on the seat as much. and you know, a little more smooth in the sky. And that's cool to, to feel that. And then to look back and remember what it was like the first couple of times, you know, running off little black, um, you know, the couple hundred times that we did it was like, okay, I think I, I can have a different experience when I go back there now. And that's a, that's a cool thing to have. Nick will jump off four times in a session. We'll get there at like four thirty, five o'clock and he'll hit it four times. And, and that is pretty dramatic. Like the, the run is brutal by the time you get to the top you're usually exhausted well i am and uh and so we used to just hustle man we knew we were going to get a five minute letter, but that was the best five minutes letter yeah if that didn't matter <laughs> didn't even matter we loved every second launch turn right glide down turn left land <laughs> that's it <laughs> kick that bush on the landing that's it yep try not to land in it yep yeah yep. which i did by the way at least once, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had a we had one episode where we um 
we were all flying and Nick came in deep in the lee and we're all practicing top landing at Little Black, which is really difficult. Uh, I would say that it's of all the sites that I can think of, it's the most, you have to be the most disciplined to be able to top land there. And Nick ended up in the bushes and, and scared the bejesus out of me. I was down in the LZ and I guess it wasn't really that bad for him, but the picking out the wing out of the bushes, it was, it was rough. That same week I full stalled about 15 feet off the ground, landed on my back in the LZ and I had to do some reflecting about yeah. what I was doing. And uh, I saw that. Yeah. Young, young David and I watched that. It's like, I don't know if you can hear it on the video, but you hit and it's like, oh my God, we better get over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can hear him talking like, oh, dad, you okay? And I'm like, yeah. Wow. You got lucky. Yeah. <laughs> don't do that ever again. Brutal. Speaking of, speaking of that, like what's, um, what would you say is some different ways to push through like that intermediate syndrome where you're, you know, just starting to get a little too confident. I personally, I think that it's each individual is going to be different. Um, but, um, I think Nick would better answer this question. Yeah. I think first, just to make sure that I'm accurate about where I am is like, I'm still just entering this intermediate syndrome piece. Um, yeah, I think both Robert and I've got super lucky so far. He had that uh, that stall collapse early on that he didn't really had any uh, any kind of injuries from. And then a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago now, I had a collapse out at Palomar and rode that thing about 300 feet down to the ground. Totally should have thrown my reserve. Didn't. Just got really lucky in the landing. Um, and I think it's, you know, both of us got lucky that we got, uh, I guess, scared straight. You know, I think I was certainly feeling like, hey, I'm a good enough pilot to do, you know, anything that the other pilots do. And I just got to work on my, my skill set. But there's also that fear management piece and understanding you know, how much fear clouds your judgment and then how on top of it you need to be. And then where you are in the whole skill spectrum. And uh, I don't think I would have said I was more than a, I don't know, four or five, but looking at it now at, out of 10, um, when I launched that day, it was more like a two. So, and I, I don't know if there's a reason there's not a good reason for me to, to think of kind of pushing through that inter intermediate syndrome. So learning a new skill, learning a new anything, if if you hurry through that period, then you miss on a lot of the the good stuff, on the juice, on the learning, on the best parts of, of that thing. And that was something I learned a long time ago, um, sailing a little boat. When I got out of the Navy, I bought this 22-foot sailboat and took it from San Diego down through the Panama Canal and then up to Florida. And then I sold it to a guy down in Jamaica. So I sold it down there. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. That's pretty rad. It was a, it was a super cool trip, a couple thousand miles, about five and a half months. And I would just kind of bump down the coast of uh, Mexico and then Central America and then back up the other side. But the whole time I wasn't out of that mindset of like, Oh, I got to get through this thing. And as funny as it sounds, I was just really hustling to get back to the states and it, you know anyone that knows me is like of course you were hustling because you're an idiot and you weren't taking the time to enjoy it <laughs> but uh it taught me at the end of that it's like why did i rush so much i could have taken a year to do that um you know the the money i needed to live every month was i don't know 300 bucks um it wasn't a ton and i i could have really stretched that out explored the caribbean more i mean i was sailing i wasn't motoring so you know didn't need gas money but for some reason just got really psyched to kind of hit a goal. And I think that's one of the most dangerous things we can do is set like a really clear goal and say, I'm going to go directly for that with no detours. And I'm going to, I'm going to knock out anything in my way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, especially in these more adventurous sports or for me, for paragliding, kind of figuring out like, Hey, this is something I want to do for the next 20 years. If I get immediately to where I want to go, say, I, you know, fly or, yeah, fly the spine of Baja this spring. What else is after that? You know, that's a stupid thing to do for me because I just don't have the the skill level to do it right now. But you finish up something big and it's like, oh, well, what's what's next? There's not much there for you. So really as an, you know, slightly older, slightly more mature guy, I'm 40 now, is looking at this and saying, how can I um, enjoy this every step of it as much as I can as I go through it? How can I, you know, get the juice out of every um, break, you know, break input out of every weight shift, out of, out of every wing over, out of every mini stall collapse, kiting session. Like, where do I, because 
what else am I going to do? You know, Robert, we talked about this the other day. Like you don't go to your grave with a U-Haul truck in the back of the hearse carrying all your stuff. So it's just about gathering as much experience as you can. And I think if we focus on gathering that experience and not focus on achieving some specific goal, um, then we have this really rich life. And that's, that's why we're doing paragliding in the first place to have fun. Yeah. That's the one thing that we got to keep in the back of our minds the whole time is that this is a leisure sport. There is nothing mandatory about the, it's not like we're rescuing people that no other flying facilities can, you know, provide. We, we're doing this because we just want to have fun yep. bottom line. And because we're hopelessly addicted, like it was a drug. Yeah. Ultra psyched on it. Yep. Yeah. I, yeah, I, that well said, you don't want to push yourself into something. Now, you know, a lot of people will, will, uh, challenge the idea that you're going to learn something that, you know, some people are good at naturally. Some people are not good at, uh, naturally there's going to be those freak of natures, but for the most part, this is a sport where you have to take your time and you have to really discipline your mind. You can't just jump in because the, here's the problem. This is how I got sucked in. It looks so easy. It looks so safe and simple, but there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that you you find out the hard way um, or you you don't get to learn. You just, you just die and that's it. Game over. And uh, that's why we have this show. We want to talk about that kind of stuff and uh, and keep people on a on a path that's going to keep them long happy and and in the air yeah so yeah. nick you have plans gigantic plans speaking of goals to fly across the the uh, spine of baja uh take us through the preparation of this and what you're doing right now and uh, who you're going to reach out to stuff like that sure well i think it's a it's a nice segue on one of the questions. I think Dimitri is asking like how often I fly or how much I'm flying or kiting a week. And I remember asking Gavin this and he said, oh, it's a, a 10 to one. And I never clarified whether it was like 10 hours flying to one hour kiting, which sounds reasonable to me or 10 hours kiting to one hour flying, which doesn't sound like most people will do it. But either way, what I'm aiming to do now is, is get out and kite one day a week. So I just came back from that before this show. And I think that was, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes of it. Um, just getting out there and, and putting in a little bit of time. And then the other four to five days a week, I'll fly. And those can be anywhere from, I don't know, a couple hours. Uh, but most of the time, they're much shorter flights. So it's like two or three 20-minute flights, just working on the launches and landings, going out. We've got a local site, Blossom. So I'll cruise out there, get a little bit of height, work on, yeah, work on uh, like body weight wing overs. So just weight shift wing overs, work on, um, spirals on doing some pitch stalls. So going back and forth <coughs> and just managing that wing as, as well as I can. And then if there's an opportunity, I'll fly a little bit longer and stay in the air longer. Most of the time, you know, where I see that I need the most improvement, where that time needs to get spent is in all that technique stuff. So maybe that answers the question. Um, for the spine of body thing, I mean, there's a lot more to it than I had initially thought. When I first came up with it, it was just looking at the map and seeing Baja. And I knew that it was a, a rad place to sail down the Pacific side of it. And I'd always been curious about the Cortez sea side or sea of Cortez. And so it, it, as I looked at it and saw that kind of series of mountains, it goes down the first third. And then there's a, looks like a really long, uh, flat section, big plain. And then at the end of it, I believe there's a, a rainforest. It gets high enough, uh, high enough up by Cabo that there's a, a rainforest way up high. And I thought that'd be a, a rad place to finish it. But looking at that and seeing kind of where I am now and the abilities that I have now and where I need to go to, to do that reasonably safely is there's at least a year's worth of work there. And so that'll be kind of looking at the weather and figuring out what are the good conditions to go, making sure I go down and scout um, as much as I can. So a couple trips down there, cruising the different parts of it, seeing what I can, uh, what I can find out. And then just a lot of time flying here and doing the, the kind of mini XCs that we can do at Blossom Cross in the Valley, coming back, going up one side of it, coming back down the other. Um, and then working with the the really good pilots here in San Diego, where we've got a lot of you know, superb pilots. So hanging out with them and just asking them questions. What are you doing? What are you thinking when you're in the air? Um, why did you make that move? What's the most important part? You know, how do you know when a thermal is good? All of those questions. And then seeing if I can incorporate their answers into something that actually works for me. Because a lot of times the fascinating thing about flying is 
it doesn't seem to me that we have a great language for it, right? If I want to teach you how to speak English or speak, you know, a, a, a verbal language, there's verbs, there's nouns, there's adjectives, um, adverbs, there's all, all kinds of, there's a structure to understanding that. But the structure for flying, as far as I can tell as a beginner, is just, hey, you, you, know, you, when, you know, when you feel, you'll hook into a thermal. And that's about it. And there's not a great description. Even now when I think about it, it's like, okay, I, I think about kind of stair stepping up in front of launch when you're pretty low and do, doing these really smooth weight shifty turns turns to get up in a thermal, but I, I can't explain it much more than it's like climbing a ladder. And I think of like hooks sticking out of my hips on the sides and like hooking on one side and then shift, you know, putting weight on that shifting and then hooking on another side. But I'm not sure if that's right. It just seems to work for me. And this um, inability to, to kind of speak a common language other than I felt that thermal or that was, you know, three meters a second um, is, is pretty, yeah, it's one of the cool challenges of flying. How much are you relying on your instruments now? Um, I leave the Vario sound turned off. So it's transmitting to the phone, to the FlySky high app. And I'll look at that and just, usually I look at that to get my height over the ground um, to make decisions as to whether or not I'm going to do whatever it is, the, the wing overs or the spirals or the pitch stalls or any of that stuff. Or if, you know, if I'm like, oh, I'm going to risk this or I'm going to take off for the cap and see if I can cross the valley. But mostly just looking at the, at the height. At the train. <clears throat> yeah. So, so no beeping, no, um, no sound telling nope. you whether or not that you're going up or down. Nope. And, no, and, and for the most part, I'm low enough, Robert, I mean, we're in a low enough that you can see the horizon and it yeah. doesn't seem to matter um, whether or not you can hear the beeping. And what I've heard over and over when I was reading a bunch about paragliding before I was able to really fly and put some time in the air was that the, the less you can involve those things in your life in the early parts and the more you can ground handle, the better a pilot you'll be in the long run. And that's what I hear from the guys on launch. Like, oh, you know, I fly without a Vario or I fly without a beeping. I, I like being up in the quiet. That's the whole reason that I fly. Um, and that, that seems important to me too. We were discussing something with Ivan, um, or I was, uh, the other day when it was really windy and really bumpy. And, and we call it bumpy. It was, in my mind, it was total chaos. And I kept on taking collapses and I felt like my wing was just out of control. And then I would go into a little thermal and I would get pulled way back. And, uh, there was just all kinds of chaos going on. And my variometer was just going beep, 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 beep. And when I landed, um, Ivan was like, you know, sometimes you just need to turn that thing off, uh, because it, it, uh, adds to the anxiety and, uh, you know, that's, it's, if it's not enjoyable, it's not enjoyable. You're out there to enjoy flying. And if you're up there in just a total panic, that kind of, that's kind of lame. Yeah. Yeah. No okay. Be flying if it sucks. Number one rule for staying safe flying for you. Got you on the spot. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking, I mean, I don't know if I have enough experience to answer that with a great answer. The thing that that I think what of do you do is making sure that I check the conditions, right? So mm, when we think good. about flying and in many sports, but in flying in particular, most guys talk about, or I hear a lot of talk about gear, you know, are you on the Enzo? Are you on the B wing? Are you on a C wing? Are you on a, whatever it is, or what's your pod or what's your electronics, all that stuff. And when we think about what is important in the air, the most important thing of all is the weather. Right. Without the weather, you can't fly. Without whether it's ridge lift or thermals, you're not flying. And then the second most important thing is pilot skill. And then way behind that, at, way down at the bottom, is equipment. And we tend to talk about it in a different um, sequence. In a different sequence. Thank you. So, yeah, when I think about like what's having gotten kind of plucked off early or launched into early in, a, in my short flying career so far, um, and gotten, you know, pulled off the mountain for not assessing the the winds correctly or the weather correctly or been out in stuff that was too turbulent um, and then watching other guys launch into stuff that was too turbulent but they felt like they had to prove something and watch them come down and they say man i shouldn't have launched for me you know the, the biggest thing is like hey this is not a sport where i can control to my satisfaction what's going on in the air all the time and so i have to make sure that that air kind of stays within limits within the limits that i think are safe for me and if it goes a little bit beyond that, as much as I might want to fly, it's better to go kite on the beach or to, you know, do something else. And 
we have a spot that we like to go to and, and kite it's, um, in, um, mission Bay park, mission Bay. Yeah. Mission Bay park is such a great place. And, um, for the most part, it, there's wind like today. I think it would have been really good. It was. Um, yeah. Did you go today? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, you did. Nice. Yeah. 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 Now one thing's, um, probably the most critical thing in my opinion, and then the number one rule of anybody who's wanting to get into the sport, kite, 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 practice, practice, practice on the ground. And there's so many little dynamics and I'm still a noob. I mean, I've got the double O on my name. I'm, but I, I really am learning every single time I kite and whether it be at the park or whether it be that I'm on launch and I'm just assessing the wind and the thermals, you can, you can, uh, know so much about what this flight is going to be like. And this goes for both paramotor and, uh, free flight. You're going to find yourself in a place where you're going to need that skill and if you have avoided it because you wanted to one, you wanted to fly, you didn't have the patience, or you said, you know what, I, I just don't have time to kite, and it's a good flying day, I'm just going to fly. And I've, I've been guilty. But there ha there's going to come. You have to make more deposits than you do take withdrawals because one day you're going to need to you're gonna need that account to have something in it. And um, if you don't, it's going to be a bad day. That's so, a great way of looking at it. Thinking of like a bank account, you know, your yeah. deposit is the ground handling, then withdrawals of the flight. That's yeah. good, man. The reward is there. I mean, if you kite long enough, it, and Nick's probably the most uh, faithful person I know to kiting in, in San Diego, hands down. He's he's constantly there. He's constantly texting me. I've just recently got um, my P3, so now I can go to Torrey Pines and kite there, and that's a really fun place to kite. And the reward is there, too. If it's good, you can go and huck it off the, the cliff and go fly around for a little bit, come in, land, play around. Um, but I, I just there's just a, a real passion, and it's fun. And I think I've said this before. I like when people come up and they're like, what are you doing? What is this? Are you, you going to fly out of the park from here? Are, can you – you know what is that does this thing carry your whole body and they're just the people get excited about it and it's kind of fun you know yeah, yeah some cool people thing. walk dogs we walk a paraglider or it walks us yeah yep so what's next on the list you you took a um you took an siv uh you did an siv and and since we're not in france we'll we'll say you went to a, a clinic and you learned some things uh, who did you do it with, and what did you take away from doing it? So did it with uh, Chris Santa Croce, who came on a while ago. Yeah, super cool guy up in Salt Lake City. Um, went out over one of the reservoirs up there, and just did a, a couple couple flights, and just had him talk me through. Uh, it was a it was an eye opening and, and rad time. Um, it was eye opening just because you see what the wing can do and what you can what you can do to it, and it'll recover on its own. It was super cool watching him teach. He is a superb instructor. Um, from what I saw, totally unflappable. We saw one guy starting to get out of control, and Chris just kind of raised his voice so he could be heard over the, the wind as this guy was kind of spinning it up. But other than that, super, super calm. And I felt, you know, working with him that, man, anything I get into, as long as I can hear this guy and, you know, act on it, he can get me out of it, which is, yeah, that's a cool place to be for a student-teacher relationship. Um, the you know, biggest thing was just, okay, this wing will recover from most of the stuff that I was really scared about. All the little bubbles, all the little collapses, even the bigger collapses. If I just get my hands up and pay attention to where my weight is, this wing's going to sort itself out. And that was super cool because I'd had a, a scary moment at Tori playing around, um, not really, you know, no one was really paying attention to me because they were working with other students. And I was starting to get into turns and wing overs and just didn't know at all what I was doing. I was just like, oh, these are super fun. I can just smash down on the brake and this glider really spins around. And then all of a sudden I went into a spin, was totally out of control beneath the cliff and, you know, hammering straight into the cliff, not knowing how to fix it. And I luckily had my hands up and was like, you know, turned at the, I don't know, I probably had plenty of, plenty of space to spare, but it didn't feel like it. And I thought, huh, I really don't know what I'm doing here. I really need to make sure that I... I get this thing dialed in because this, you know, if I'm going to pursue fun at this level with this kind of consequence, I better make, make that investment in skill as well. 
And so going up there was was rad to get that time in, um, not only doing the course itself and getting the basics out of the way or, or going through the basics at least once, but to do it with him especially was, you know, was a special thing. You plan on doing another one? Oh, yeah. You and I are going up doing one, dude. It's coming down the pike. Mm-hmm. Yep. So when we but talk you know, about – when we talk about, um, you know, incidents, because both of us uh, kind of have a disposition towards Palomar because I had a cascade event there and uh, where I lost, I would say, more than 50% of my wing and I didn't lean into the good side and it quickly shot out in front of me and was quickly turned into a face down spiral. And uh, with bad inputs, I lost a, a, a over a thousand feet within one minute. I mean, it was really fast and you know you typically don't have a thousand feet to make a correction and uh so that that day uh was a big eye opener for me and it, it made me do a lot of reconsidering of of the sport and what i was capable of doing now you had your event um after your siv so and i know we've talked about this quite a bit but uh let's maybe relive it just in case we can uh, pull something else out of it. Um, you you have a collapse, uh, a sizable one, I assume. And where did you go wrong after that? Um, well, I think it's probably starting before that. On that day, I was the first guy to launch. It was a fly-in day. And it's one of those things they tell you like, hey, don't launch until you know a couple of really good guys launch and you watch them. And I was in that mode of like, hey, get out of my way. I'm here to fly. This looks good to me made that assessment and got up and it was actually okay. But just allowing myself to get away with that kind of crappy judgment up front, um, it allowed the gate for judgment to be much lower. So got up to the top of the, the ridge at Palomar and then took off with a couple guys thinking like, Oh, today I'll go XC. I'll try this out. This is my first time. And just didn't pay attention to how far back I was getting behind the ridge. And so mistake number one was just not having that situational awareness to know, hey, once you get far enough back behind the ridge, there's going to be that rotor coming over. It's going to hit you, and you're going to have you're going to have to deal with that collapse. So that situational awareness piece is like way before anything else. Um, the second part is once it collapsed, you know, because I'd done the SIV and thought like, oh, I've done an SIV, I can get myself out of anything, which is what all the the pros and the good guys tell you. Like, don't think like that. That's a stupid thing to think, but. You know, we, we all think we're different and we're special and, and by God, I'm my own little snowflake. And, uh, so I was like, Oh, I can fight, you know, I can kind of get the wing to do what I want. So rather than just getting my hands up, letting the wing sort itself out and fly, I was busy trying to pump it out. Um, and there's really, there's no good, there's no good defense for that. That was just a stupid thing to do. I'm um, just caught up in the moment, kind of overcome by events and thinking I could pump it out. The wing would start to reinflate and I'd say, okay, this, you know, this is it. And it would get just a little bit forward. And then I would be worried about it shooting and I would, you know, accidentally collapse it again, pumping the brakes and basically did that kind of looking down, seeing the ground coming up, checking out. Um, I don't think I was looking at the altimeter at all, altimeter at all, but just seeing like, okay, I got another 30 seconds. I got a minute. I got, you know, 20 seconds, whatever it is. Like, I, I should probably throw my reserve right now. Like, no, I can get this out. I should definitely throw my reserve. No, I can absolutely get this out. Like, ah, it's too low to throw the reserve. I'm not coming down that fast. And I just got lucky that number one, the wing was kind of reinflating as I came down the last part. You know, this is, I think, classic, totally forget what happened, but I'm guessing my hands went up. The wing started to reinflate. I hit the ground um, and it was on a nice, steep, sandy slope. So I just slid the last foot or two down. Um, fell down, hit my head pretty good on the pavement because I landed right on the road on Palomar and S6. Uh, the wing collapsed in one lane of the road, and I got up. You know, you, you know when you get hit with something pretty hard, you you get up like a scared animal. Um, <laughs> anyone's ever shot a deer knows that they usually don't fall over. Um, they bolt off, and that's totally what happened to me. Is just jumped up before I knew anything was right or wrong, grabbed the wing, scurried across the road, and then stopped and did a little assessment. It was like, okay, you know, I skinned my knee and banged this up and rung my bell pretty good. Um, you know, and then hitchhiked home from there. That was Wild. it. <clears throat> yeah, same same exact thing. I would say the big takeaway from that for me was uh, heavy handedness, uh, and exactly what you described. Every time I felt the wing was shooting out in front, I felt like I needed to check it. And I've noticed <clears throat> with with flying, and and you can do this with uh, 
uh, pitch doing pitch uh, work, the the wing will actually go way out in front, way farther than you think before it'll collapse. And um, I mean, obviously, when you're flying, there's dynamics involved. You've got thermals. Um, you know, we we're I was pondering the idea of when you get when you get plucked, um, or I shouldn't say plucked when you when you get pulled back by a thermal and your wing goes way back behind you. And I heard someone talking about pushing on speed bar a little bit went in that moment to kind of correct that and then uh, letting it fly uh, or uh, the, the opposite, you know, getting a little bit deep in your brakes. In the very beginning, I was uh, doing well with the thermals because I would fly so incredibly slow in the thermal. But the problem was, that's not the way you want to do it. You've you want to keep some some speed when you're in the thermal. And would you agree to that? You you don't want to uh, be flying at almost um, stall just so you can stay inside the thermal or to keep your wing from shooting back. Yep, yep. I mean, I think the the takeaway there's a there's probably a bunch of takeaways here. Is yeah connect more with the experienced pilots, ask them more, kind of follow their guidance more. Don't rely on yourself so much early and then just spend way more time than you think figuring out your wing and figuring out what happens. And I think one of the takeaways from, from that for me was, and I've heard it over and over again. It's funny, you know, I say like, I should have thrown my reserve and there's always someone that's like, yeah, you should have thrown. It's like, yes, I know I should have thrown my reserve. I get it. Like I did the wrong thing. It's the same thing with SIVs. They say like, hey, your first reserve or your first SIV is just your first SIV. That's it. It just gets you familiar with what an SIV is. But, you know, going through it, I felt like, okay, now I know how the wing works. And I had that overconfidence from thinking that I that I knew and was uh, more than I did and was able to do more than I can do. And, I, and that's probably part of this whole thing is like, hey, getting a couple SIVs in a year, if you can afford it, man, that is that's fantastic insurance and just gets you more exposure to what that wing looks like in odd situations and then how to get yourself out of them. Uh, would you say once good? Would you say that you went to the SIV prematurely? No, it was no, good. I, it was, I, good I was a super good thing. I mean, I think <clears throat> a lot of these accidents that we've had are basically unavoidable, right? There's, there's a perfect path that nobody follows. That is you kite until you can, um, heli that thing on the ground you know until you're a, a fantastic kiter you're beyond um, intermediate and then you do really small flights for a long time and then you get introduced to thermals and you have one or two instructors with you for every thermal for two or three years and you get really dialed on them and eventually you get to a point where you fly on your own and you're really good and the whole time you've been safe well nobody does that for a, a variety of reasons right that's going to cost way too much money that's going to cost your your instructors and you way too much time like nobody will do it so it ends up that we try and make this sport as safe as we can given the personalities of the people who come into it and focus on doing the best we can to, to make it as safe as, as we can as we go through knowing that every time we're putting our life out there and it's a stupid thing you know it's or it's not stupid thing it's just a, a riskier thing than then you, or you could find less risky things to do to have fun, right? But for whatever reason, this this kind of thing attracts us, and we have to go through and say, all right, how much of this can, how much of this risk can we mitigate, and then how much of this is just gonna, you you go into the unknown, knowing that you don't know, and that's part of the attraction of the sport. For me, I think we Nick, have. What is, oh, go ahead. Oh, Nick, what is uh, what's your comfort level on? Full stalls. Carl Colorado was uh, asking in the chat. Sure. Um, I mean, comfort levels scale of one to ten. I don't know, one or two. I did a couple of them at that SIV. Haven't done one since. And so that's one of those things where we get, you know, three hundred and sixty or three hundred fifty days of flying a year here in San Diego. Um, all the flying I've been able to do since that since that accident was, I mean, right after the accident, I was like, okay, I'm going to go out. And I'm going to do a full stall every flight, as many full stalls as I can recover, you know, thermal back up, full stall again until I have this thing dialed because I feel like having that in my toolkit would have saved me. And so far, um, the flying that I've been doing, which is mostly at Blossom, 
there hasn't been enough height for me. And for me, I think a thousand meters over the ground is like, that's where to go. If I'm going to do a full stall on my own, um, you know, with or without radio, radio guidance at this point, a thousand meters over the ground is, is what I need. And that just hasn't happened yet. So I guess it's an excellent question and probably something that's really important to do, but yeah, I think it's, it's probably going to end up waiting for the SIV or next SIV I do, um, or, you know, get out to horse or, or just have some days where I get higher. Said so you said meters. Um, that's foreign. Yeah, I think three thousand feet. Oh boy, duck fat lemon bars. Yeah, they're coming. You should. Get <laughs> that's Aaron. <laughs> She's a big fan of paleo treats. Go to paleotreats.com dot com for this, for the most wonderful snacks you'll find, and they're they're healthy snacks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, a thousand meters, so three thousand thirty three hundred feet, whatever it is. But it's it's a ton of space. So. When I was talking to, oh, I forget who it was, uh, Harrison, and I was telling him my plan, he was like, hey, dude, <laughs> you better be high enough to screw that thing up and fix it three times before you even think about that. And so if you think of each one of those episodes as taking you uh, 300 meters or 1,000 feet, yep. you know, it's, it's not the safest thing to do. The safest thing is to go to another SIV, do it over water with reserves, with, with guidance in your ear. Totally get that. I get that's the right thing to do. Uh, if I have the opportunity to do a full stall, thousand meters over the ground without an instructor or radio guidance, one hundred percent, I'm doing it, um, and I'll get to an SIV as fast as I can and, and kind of finish that off. And that's that's this whole equation here is that we're we're playing this game where we put our life up every time and say, okay, this is what I'm willing to put up, and it doesn't make sense, just flat out doesn't. There's nothing we get out of it. I mean, there's whatever, almost a thousand people watching this, you know, compared to the six billion people on the planet nobody nobody cares about paragliding you know so we're doing this for ourselves <laughs> and for like the stoke that we get on on mastering a difficult and high consequence skill and it's by the way the most awesome sport that there is on the planet you put an airplane in a backpack and you go hike up a hill and you huck it okay <laughs> it's a pretty cool thing yeah don't yeah. Don't try to downsell this one, buddy. <laughs> I agree 100%. 100%. When we talk about taking it to the next level, I, in my mind, I'm wanting to do cross country. Now, you know, there's all the, all kinds of limitations. Obviously the biggest limitation is weather, what the weather's going to, uh, what the weather's going to do that day. Can we, is it possible to do that? Um, the next thing that I'm working on is being better at sniffing out thermals and getting in. That's only going to come by time. What are you currently working on that uh, you would say, this is, this is my next thing that I want to master uh, to get to the next level? Let's see. So there's, there's a should here that I just don't care that much about, but is probably the most important thing is I should figure out the, the weather conditions and, basically the number and the kind of prediction pieces that we can look at on the, basically on the computer, on the phone that will indicate a good weather day for whatever reason right now. I just don't care about that that much right now. I look at some really basic stuff, look at soaring predictor at Wingram, um, at Mesa West and kind of get a real general feel and then go out and, and test it. Um, I know guys are way more into the weather than that. And they seem to have much more accurate predictions and a, and a much better idea of what's going on in the sky. But for me, while I think that's an important thing, it's just not something I'm into. So the stuff that I'm working on right now, I break it into, um, yeah, like pilot skills that are are very discreet. You know, launching and landing off a specific spot. So can I hit? Can I get onto this rock lightly? Can I land lightly? Can I launch in control? Can I bring my wing up in high winds and control on a ridge where there's more pressure from the air? And then I think about what happens in the sky. So can I do uh, weight shift wing overs that are even, meaning that I come, you know, go out to one side and back to the other and that it doesn't slowly kind of turn around so that I, I'm, I'm on one side or another too hard. And um, that seems to be something that just ties into everything else. And it makes me way more comfortable in the, the thermals that I think are rowdier that I've been in. Um, and then the pitch stalls. So just the brakes and then letting it shoot forward and the brakes and letting it shoot forward and getting bigger and bigger and getting used to that. And then doing some turns out of that and kind of half a wing over um, spirals down. So just managing that, that seems to be a, a super cool feeling as you start to get into that 
spiral down um, and just balancing with the hands. Yeah. Um, that's, that's pretty exciting to, I've been enjoying that. that. Yeah. That wing like stiffen up at some point and then you just really get to take the time and, and think about how you're moving. And a lot of that stuff is doing the skill and then seeing if I can expand my essay, my situational awareness. So while I'm doing the wing over, can I look around? Can I see other people? Can I decide like, okay, this is where I want to exit into a turn um, versus I'm just going to do this thing until I screw it up. And so expanding that situational awareness constantly, Hey, I'm doing a pitch stall. Okay. This is getting pretty big. This is where I want to be. Look around like, all right, I can see there's nobody behind me. Now I can make a nice tight turn to the left without thinking that someone might be there. Um, so pitch stalls, weight shift wing overs, um, the spirals and three sixties. And then the last part is the, I think it's kind of the sexiest when you look at the, the movie side of it, the, um, the filming part where the Rocky Mountains Traverse kind of got me into paragliding is the cross country part. But for me, like cruising over at this point, making the crossing over to Blossom Valley to El Cap is a, it's a cool thing, but I'm, I'm way more focused on getting my skills dialed at Blossom over that launch, going up in a thermal, seeing, you know, I hear over and over, turn tighter, turn tighter in a thermal. How tight can I turn before I turn too tight? And just how can I build up my own internal body language to understand what's going on and what the best rate of turn is and the best angle of bank and the best weight placement is? And then how can I expand my essay as I'm going around those circles? Can I be looking around super comfortably without throwing myself off and and, and popping out of the thermal? So those those really basic fundamental skills are what I think about doing um, every time I'm going out and flying. Very good. Um, more recently, you switched wings. You upgraded to what some would say is a uh, spicy wing. And um, maybe just comment on that and and um, talk about your, are you loving it? Is it is it what all that you wanted it to be? Is it more than you wanted it to be? I think it's exactly what I wanted. So I went from I guess start off with the Buzz Z, which is the second generation of the Buzz. Uh, it was pretty old, pretty beat up. Uh, when I took it in a Tory, they said that you should have stopped flying this thing a long time ago. It has the porosity of a laundry bag. Um, and then I went to, gosh, was it a UPXC something? Um, and that was also pretty beat up. And I was just getting the wings as cheap as I could get them. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah borrowing that one from Wendy and send it back to her. <laughs> I mean, that, that highlights the idea of having a rad instructor is the single best thing you can do in the sport is have an, a superb instructor. And I just got really lucky to find one who cared way more about instruction and making sure I was uh, safe and competent before doing anything else. So she went out of her way um, and definitely kind of out of her pocketbook to make sure that I was safe as I went forward. Um, and that's, that was a, a super cool thing and, and a debt that I probably won't be able to repay to her at least uh, this time around or until I have, I have a student myself and get good and decide to, to go that path. Um, and then the third wing that I got, the one that I'm on now is a Jin Carrera plus. So that's a high B. Um, I've been told that it's a C wing with the B rating. Um, but usually when people are saying that they're thinking about the Jin Carrera and not the plus, um, it sounds backwards, but the plus is actually a lower rated wing than the Carrera. And it's still a, a pretty hot B. The um, wing tips still like to kind of fold around and, and dance and collapse every so often. But uh, it's been a super fun wing. And it's been one of those things where I thought I can fly this thing super hard um, and and it'll take me anywhere that I have the skill to go. And it'll take any pilot with a lot of skill anywhere they want to go. And the, you know, the, the biggest difference is going to be in those straight line glides in a competition. And at this point, I don't really care about doing super well in a competition. Um, I don't have any comps on my horizon as far as like, oh, I've got to go do that. Um, so for right now, just like the basic skills over and over and over and over until they're they're down, that's what I'm into. Love it. And th that's a big thing that we were talking about that with uh, Max Martini, you know, with um, Acro. Because I mean, Acro, it's it can be you know you can be a half inch too deep and it makes a world of difference in what you're doing and so it's got to be just something that you're doing over and over and over and over and over and becomes this completely natural thing that i'm finding more and more that this that's exactly what this sport is all about i really was focused because my instructor and i'll just call him my instructor phil rustman 
he pushed uh, uh, multiple times, work on your top landing, work on your top landing, because we're at Blossom all the time. And, um, you know, just touch and goes, come in, swoop around, land and work on that. And, and that was something that I was very passionate about. You can't learn those things from a book. You can't learn those things from kiting per se. You have to do it. It's there's all these variables, wind speed, the lift that's in front of the launch, all, all these different things. So every time I fly, there's some different variable involved. And I think that's part of the reason why I really love the sport. Uh, one is that weather aspect. I love what I'm learning on the weather. Every single time I go on there, I'm learning something else. And obviously, um, you know, just the, the challenge of it and the fact that there's, you know, there is some um i mean it's dead it's a deadly potentially deadly sport what we're doing is not this is not a a game and uh i i lo i love that aspect you know i rode a motorcycle i i sold my motorcycle to fly i, I do need to I, I needed to mitigate the risk obviously uh but uh in extreme sports has been in my blood i love it um i know that you're uh, an adventurous person i mean sailing uh, through the Panama Canal and and going across five months worth of sailing, uh, that's an adventure. You've been on other adventures, obviously with the with the military and and been around the world in some places, uh, or you know every place. Sure, Sometimes the Navy just yeah, yeah <laughs> every, send you everywhere. Um, but uh, there's something about that, something about the um, just the excitement of it. You know, uh, I really believe that life, I'll, I'll say it like this, God intended for us to search out this, this planet that he made and, and find out, you know, he made some pretty cool things and we were designed to go on, and on it, on an adventure, a life adventure and, and to find it all. And I, I like how you said, you know, I was running and it was, it was 2d and then you were like, you know what, I want to paraglide so I can see this in, in another dimension. And that's yeah. so rad. Yeah. No, it's, a, it's a super cool sport. Totally cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see. A couple questions came up from. Yeah. Carl. I was going to say, we want to bust out some of these questions. If you have more questions, um, fire them off right now. We're almost to the end of the show. Um, the, um, the one question I saw back there. The fly solo team on XC. Dude, I'm, I'm not really doing XC flights. If I'm doing them, it's going to be usually with another person. Um, the other day I had Chris Otmar, Chris Otmar kind of talking me through my first there and back where I didn't land on the far side over at El Cap. Um, and that was super helpful to know which ridge to go for and which one to stick to as I, as I got over to that side. But most of this stuff, I'm not really worried about being with someone else, <coughs> at, at least at Blossom, because I'm not doing that cross-country stuff yet. Hey, uh, didn't you land um, at the base of El Cap one time? A couple times, yeah. Yeah, a yeah. couple times. Yeah, so the other day was the first time where I actually got back to Blossom. Oh my word! I think I landed over the far side twice, and then I came back once and landed way, um, like just not just on the other side of the power line, just on the other side of the road, kind of halfway up the hill and ran back. Oh my gosh! So, it. so speed bar on glide. Um, I've been playing around with it and kind of quarter speed bar and seeing if I can make that work, but um. I think more of the speed bar stuff is like Robert was saying is as you're going through um, those thermals and, and when blossom gets kind of starts to glass off, there's still thermals that you can go through, but you can really practice as you get pitched back, kind of using that speed bar to keep that nose down a little bit and, uh, and punching through it. But that's something I'm just starting to explore. Yeah, that is advanced in my opinion. Like I was trying it the other day and it was probably too windy to be playing around with it too much, maybe quarter bar, like you said. Um, just a little bit here and there. I've heard guys talk about it, but that's advanced, man. That's like, you know, these, uh, you, you're not going to be a pro skater in one year. It's going to take some time. You're going to have to work through it. You're not going to be a, a, a professional athlete in one year. It's going to take some time. Same thing with this sport. And, and in my opinion, you're still kind of new at three and four years, even if you're really aggressive at pursuing this sport. Um, I still feel like an absolute baby and I, I still think I am a, a, an absolute baby at the sport. And uh, I'm glad to look back at some of the videos and see that I'm doing better than I was, but I still feel e extremely new. 
and um, it's probably safe uh, to to live that way. And if you if you want to take on one thing uh, about a, a character uh, attribute in this sport, be humble and accept any information, any critique that you can. I think one of the the best things that you can do is allow people to 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 uh, troll your videos that you post on YouTube and just accept what they say. Study it. <laughs> I've had a couple couple videos where I'm like, man, I, I don't even know if I want to post this because I know that the trolls are going to come out from under the bridge and it's going to be just on. And uh, But you know what? Realistically, everybody that I've flown with in person has been really cool to give information and just and and everybody, you know, they want to help each other. You want to you want to learn from each other. Yep. And, uh, yeah, and you've been that, good about what, putting your putting your whole thing out there, the good and the bad. And that's been pretty cool to see. And and just what you're doing with this channel is like, hey, you and I aren't experts, but we're sharing as much as we know and putting it out there. And you know, the old line is like, oh, if this saves one person, it's worth it. But at the end of the day, like it may or may not do that. I think it's just getting it out there that hey, none of us are have this thing dialed and we're all trying to do the best we can and, and sharing this information is is an important part of uh, the overall kind of growth of this section of dudes in the sport yeah we have a we have a great community uh by the way so appreciate everybody watching 42 people are watching live from wherever you are uh around the world really appreciate you checking out uh paragliding talk go to the website paraglidingtalk.com i want to encourage you uh, to support the show financially if you can at uh, Patreon. And I also set up an account with PayPal. You can support the show there and uh, make it worth my while. It'd be really great if I can um, turn this thing into something huge and benefit all of us that are watching, getting some gear. Uh, Nick and I have been strategizing how we can get some sponsors for the show. Maybe we'll do a little advertising for somebody and uh, get some free gear or promote some gear or get some discounted gear. So if you have ideas about that, um, I'm going to start the campaign very soon of reaching out to some of these uh, different companies and see what we can do with the show and uh, do some, I, I'm, it won't be long and you'll be he hearing me doing commercials. Welcome to paraglidingtalk.com. We want us, we want to take a short break to uh, talk about this it. gear. <laughs> oh, it'll be great. It'll be great. That's funny. I know I, I see you in there, Tavens. Read the comments, Dad. Look at I'm gonna unsubscribe if you don't if you don't do this. <laughs> cool. We'll just, we'll just block you. So um I want to put a plug in real quick for the Facebook group. Well, we started a Facebook oh, group yeah. for the show. So if you wanna if you wanna join that Facebook group, you know, post your videos or whatever, we'll try and exchange information, try to avoid the trolling and all that to see another Facebook group. So just a talk show and you'll see us there. Nice. Where uh where can they find that link? Um it's I it's should be paragliding talk show if you search it in Facebook, uh the search toolbar. Okay, it paragliding talk show. Yeah, the we'll, logo, uh, the logo's on there, so you can't miss it. Okay, perfect. And I'll put that link in the description after we're done with uh, with the show here. Cool. And so if there's uh, any other questions, Carl said, Nick. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw that. So that's a good one, Carl. Um, and that's something I like to hit a bunch. Um, I, this is something that the Navy well, had let, to teach. Let me ask through. the question. Yeah. It says, Nick, how do you do a stress Reset. rest i think it means reset reset okay i laugh to calm down others yell at the wing i think russman yells at the wing too he yells at everything right <laughs> we call so, him cussman yeah we talk about um talk about the big four with with mental toughness is what they were calling it the last time i checked um i spent some time uh, teaching teaching in that whole pipeline and that was what we taught as big four. And, and none of this stuff is secret. So it's not like you can't Google it, but we talk about uh, goal setting, self-talk, visualization, and arousal control. So I'll go through those pretty quickly. This should take, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. Um, if you got it, if you guys are cool with, with going a little bit longer, then we'll hit it. So goal setting is saying, hey, this is what I'm going to do in um, five minutes, in five days, five weeks, five months, five years. And so one of the ways to make it through whatever your sticky, sticky situation is in the wing is rocking that goal setting as much as you can. So if it's, you know, Hey, I'm going to make sure that I get my hands up, which is now one of my kind of new uh, emergency goals. 
that's what it is. No matter what it takes, get them up and then reassess. Or it can be, hey, I want to do three flights today or four top landings or whatever it is. So that sets you up for for success um, as you're going through the sport. And it also can set you up for success in an emergency. The second thing is self-talk. So this is something that all top athletes do, all top performers do. And it can be pretty simple. Um, Gavin talks about, what does he say to himself? I got this. He says that over and over, like, I got this stuff. I got this. And so that can be, I got this. I'm, I've, I've got this. I'm calm. I can do this. Whatever it is, uh, you can get as jack handy as you want on it, but it'll, I mean, these are the things that the sports psychologist at the top of the game have studied and this self-talk um, works. And so I had one guy who used to, uh, when I was teaching this stuff at CrossFits, he would say FTFT, which is finish this effing thing. Um, and he would say that over and over and over. He'd just say FTFT, FTFT, and kind of finish his workout, whatever it was. So that's the self-talk. Number three, and this is probably most um, pertinent to what you're asking, is we call it arousal control. It has nothing to do with sex. It's all about what's going on in your bloodstream and your excited life. So when that adrenaline starts pumping, how do you calm it back down? Now, this is usually something that happens um, after an event or right before you think it's going to get scary. So you think you see yourself going into a cloud or you think you're going to do a difficult launch um, or after you had a crash or after you had an event is the easiest thing to do is what we call four, four for four. So uh, breathing, it's four seconds in, four seconds out for four minutes. Now, most people won't do it for four minutes. If you do that for the four minutes, so... It's that easy. Four minutes, that's the same as eight minutes of sleep for your brain. So that'll reset your brain. So that's an excellent that thing again? to do pre-launch if you're getting a little too fired up. It's also an excellent thing to do um, post-event if you're still kind of shaking and you're still flying, like, okay, I need to get a hold of myself, is go right into that four, 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 four. I've done that a bunch, um, especially early on when I went into a thermal that I didn't I didn't know how to get out of. It was this massive thermal uh, lighting off from a factory down in Otai. And I was just going up, had no idea how to get down and started to freak out. I was like, okay, get, get on that, uh, arousal control and calm back down. Um, now that I'm a little bit more dialed in with it, you have time to think about what your pulse is doing, but really if you get that breath under control and do the four seconds in four seconds out, you're going to be, uh, much better, much further down the, the line. And then the last thing visualization is thinking about all of the things that can go wrong and go right before you fly. So when we think about how do you get really good, really fast at anything? Yes, you have to do the training. You have to go out and physically do the kiting. You have to do physically do the flying. You have to physically look at the weather. You know, have to do all those skills. But obviously, that's not easy for everybody. Not everybody lives in San Diego. Not everybody lives in a place where you can fly every day of the year. So visualization is one of those things that you can do. It's just setting the time up to do it. So you're visualizing in as much detail as you can what it smells like, what it sounds like, what it feels like, what it looks like any of those things and all of those things to the best of your ability um, in any event. So what does this feel like in a wing over? How does this weight shift feel as I get to the top of this? And then how do I quickly shift my weight back? Or what does it feel like when I look up and I see that the wing is balled up on this side or totally folded over on this side and I've got to get it back out? Um, the, the classic story told about visualization and the power of visualization is the basketball story. So they split a bunch of basketball kind of kids into three groups. Number one, shot baskets, and they just shoot, practice shooting baskets for, I don't know, 15 minutes a day, a couple days a week for four weeks. The number two group um, played just played basketball and kind of scrimmage, so they're playing around with the ball, bouncing it, passing it, whatever, shooting baskets every so often. And then the number three group sat on the bench and visualized shooting the perfect basket. At the end of the four-week study, whatever it is, there's basically no difference between the group that sat on the bench and the group that shot the baskets as to how much they improved. So... When you're thinking about how do I get really good at something, um, one thing we do is like, how do, how do the world-class people get good at, or what do the world-class people do? And those four things, that goal setting, self-talk, arousal control, and visualization are what, what all the best guys do. And, and that's, to answer your short question with a long answer, that's what I do when I get a little freaked out. So you said four breaths in four seconds for four minutes? It's what, no, it's four, four seconds four, four. inhale, four oh. seconds exhale. Okay. So one, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three, four. And just do that over and over for four minutes. Okay. What's up, Mark? Hey. How you doing, brother? So when you, I, you 
I've done that same thing before where I've, um, and, and this is going to sound kind of crazy, but uh, back in the day when I used to um, use drugs and I would come to the end of my drugs and I would want to go to sleep and I couldn't. And the only way I could was to breathe. That was my, my that was my, my only way. And uh, I know it's probably a horrible example, but uh, that that is the way that you um, bring your heart rate down, right? Isn't that something that, especially with training, uh, you know, you're if you're behind a gun and and you're you're fighting, yep. uh, the anxiety. Yeah, yeah, working the breathing and that leads to the heart rate. I mean, that's something I do. So I work with some Red Bull athletes. Um, kind of getting them to do various things with working out. And that's one of the first things we'll do is we'll get all the athletes in a circle and we'll sync up everybody's pulse and everybody's breath. So if you're in a circle, you're sitting down cross-legged, you take the pulse of the guy on your the girl on your right and you give your pulse to the guy or the girl on your left and you just try and match up the pulse that you feel in your body to the pulse that you feel in the wrist of the person next to you. And we'll take a couple minutes until we sync that up as best we can. And that leads to, you know, a much higher incidence, as far as I can tell, of group flow, where whatever activity we're all doing together, uh, we're much more in sync and we're able to achieve way more than we normally would. So, I mean, now you're getting into kind of the science of performance and, and how no, to that's good. get really good people a little bit better or, you know, the rest of us a lot better. Um, those, are, those are cool things to do. Can you hear me now, Mark? Can you hear me now? No. You got to put your headphones on, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Andrew, I, I speed bar. yeah, I, so far I haven't found a good way other than to squat, um, you know, squat a bunch and, and get those, my skinny little getaway sticks a little bit stronger um, to hold that speed <laughs> bar out for a while. But luckily I haven't been up in the air for six hours mashing that thing down the whole time. And yeah, I got work to do there. I, I haven't, uh, you know, I, I will say this. When I'm coming back from El Cap and there's a little bit of headwind, you your your legs do get tired i'm i'm on full speed bar well it's it's not technically full speed bar but i'm it's as far as i can push my speed bar i i do need to make some adjustments on that eventually but um with that with one foot or the other uh i've been really working on that just playing with speed bar that i think that's my next um focus uh i feel like i've got a pretty decent handle on top landing I'm wanting to um, get better, obviously, at getting in the thermals, but adding speed bar to the tool list, I think, is a is a pretty important thing. The only drawback is that when you increase the angle of attack, you're gonna you're more susceptible to um, collapse. Take a collapse. Yep. Totally decrease angle of attack. So when That's your wing it. is out here like this. It's more susceptible to collapsing. But I mean, listening to Gavin's last or a couple of podcasts ago, he was talking about like, hey, that's how guys are rolling is full bar almost all the time, just skidding around the sky. And I think that's one of those things that, you know, let's get to the point where we can handle all the collapses with the speed bar pretty much all the way in and then start working it out, flying around. How, how long can you fly around with it a quarter speed bar? How long can you fly around with a half speed bar until your leg strength is up and you're totally dialing it and you're working the, the C's? Um, or whatever your rear risers are. And then how do you get it out at, at full bar and stay in the sky and, um, you know, manage that wing. Amazing. Well, I really appreciate everybody coming, uh, everybody watching the show. And, um, I think we're going to call this a wrap. Um, uh, Nick's a regular on the show. He's, he's, um, most of the time he'll come on and, uh, Just and learn. join us. So I, I know, I noticed Craig said, Nick, uh, inspiring. Hope to see you join often and that, um, me too. So, uh, thanks, we have, hey, uh, it's cool to get yeah. on and share whatever we got. Yeah. I love it, man. We, we've got something great and, um, I'm just, I'm glad that, that I get to be a part of it. Uh, yeah. thanks all the moderators, all the guys that, uh, have helped out in the chat and the talks. We've got some pretty cool shows coming up. Uh, next week, we're going to be having Giuseppe. Uh, Giuseppe Free is an acro pilot that flies tandems and uh, has an incredible flying style. And um, 
just a super cool guy. He's going to come on the show next week. Uh, the following week, we're, we're going to be having uh, Tony Boyer. He's going to come on the show. He's a uh, wing wool. He's flown hang gliders and paragliders. And so he's got a really unique perspective about flying that uh, not many people that we've had on the show has. He's got a, just a, a really cool story. Uh, we're going to have him. And then we also have, um, I haven't mentioned it to anybody, but uh, since you're live with us and, and uh, there's some breaking news, we've got uh, a woman named Kingza who set some pretty big cross country records in um, the UK. And her name, her last name is uh, hard to say, but I think it's Master Liz. Uh, I'm probably messing that up, but it's Kinga. K I N G A, and uh, I'll be putting up the pictures and stuff like that for the for the ad. I'm just trying to nail down the date that she's going to be on, and then somewhere in the middle of May, we're going to have Mark Honeycut, who's a paramotor pilot. I know all you paramotor guys are like, "Hey, what's up? Why all these free flight guys?" <laughs> motors wants, on this thing. Who wants some motors on the show? And so uh, those are coming soon. And and uh, again, really appreciate everybody. Uh, Neil, thanks. I appreciate what you do, and uh, not just for the show, but what you do in general. And um, we're gonna we're gonna keep on flying and keep this thing rolling. So really appreciate everybody. Appreciate all the Patreon supporters. Keep supporting the show, and uh, we will see you next Thursday. We're gonna have a short um, uh, post meeting on the show here. And uh, for everybody else, have a great night. Really appreciate you. Have a great night and have fun. Be safe, and we'll see you in the air. Out.